<clears throat> My thoughts this morning are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6 to the end of the chapter and the end of the book. Quite often, after Paul has addressed the issues at hand with churches or people in his letters, he will close his books with a very practical exhortation or admonition of things that appear to be needful for that particular person or church. That is definitely the case in the situation with the Thessalonian church. As I mentioned at the beginning of this series, the church, or I, I, I correct that, it was not the church, it was probably a small number of people in the church who either misunderstood Paul's teaching on the second coming and the time leading up to it, or were mistaught by other people to believe something very different than what Paul taught. Paul taught that the second coming is imminent, meaning that biblical prophecy in terms of the major events has been fulfilled and the Lord can come when he's ready, but that time is not at hand. It's not here now and it's not immediate. They decided in their minds his coming was immediate. He, if he hadn't already started the process, it was on its way and it would be occurring any day. So much so that they quit their jobs, res resigned from responsible activity in life, and were literally living on whatever their savings were, and possibly even on the charity of the church, instead of working and providing for their families and for their needs. So Paul tries to correct that. He goes about it in a very personal and direct way. In the, in the passage you will study. I've thought over the years and believed very sincerely and deeply that if Christian people practice their faith, a church should be the safest place on planet Earth where human beings gather together. And often that's not the case. <laughs> because for whatever reasons, people don't practice their faith. How does a church go about communicating to someone in the congregation that their belief or their lifestyle is not acceptable and not according to the teaching of scripture and do so in a constructive way to help and not to tear down? It's a challenge, isn't it? I, the, the reasons abound, let me give you a, a couple or, or so. I taught, this was over 50 years ago, with a young couple, hadn't been married that long. He and his family came from Primitive Baptist background, she from a contemporary church that had been very strong in the secret rapture dispensational ideas of second coming. She told me in our conversation, Joe, you and my husband cannot imagine what you avoided by not growing up in a home that teaches these ideas. And she told me the experience. When she was seven years old, she would wake up in the middle of the night, not hear a single sound, and horror would strike her heart. What if the rapture has occurred and I'm the only one left in this house? How can a seven-year-old survive in this crazy world without loving adults to take care of them? And she would get up out of bed go to her parents' bedroom door and stand there in horror till she heard one of them breathing. And then she'd go back to bed and go to sleep. That's not safe or comfortable, is it? It's horrible. <clears throat> there as well, 
I've seen a few churches like this, very legalistic churches that you, you there is a, an, an un, a written law or an unwritten law, but there's a law. And if you violate that law, people may say something to you. They may not. But if you keep doing it, suddenly there's a business meeting and you're no longer a member. Excommunication, you're out. <laughs> and if you live in a situation like that, it's hardly conducive to tenderness and gentle grace and love. The objective Paul identifies in this text is twofold. Number one, if someone is acting or thinking in a way that's not in harmony, communicate, don't ignore, communicate that issue to that person, but communicate it with encouragement. Try to help that person find repentance and restoration and healing. The objective is to heal, not to destroy. <clears throat> We read, start with verse six, second Thessalonians, <clears throat> pardon me, chapter three, verse six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both command and in the name are two very formal, very rigid ideas. Paul is not saying this is kind of a good idea if you want to practice it. He's saying this is a compulsory, necessary way to think about things, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition <clears throat> which he received of us. Withdraw here, or, or disorderly. Uh, disorderly carries the idea of some form of irresponsible conduct, it was used in military circles, pardon me. <coughs> it was used in military circles of someone who did not follow the military orders of his superior officer. Interestingly, several New Testament Greek dictionaries also include a sense of idleness, the very issue that is a problem with the Thessalonian church. He's, Paul is addressing the issue, not ignoring it. This is probably not an issue that started with the first Thessalonian letter. A lot of commentaries say they misunderstood Paul's second coming teaching in the first letter, and so he wrote the second letter to correct it. However, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says that he admonished the Thessalonian church to study, to be quiet, to mind your own business. We'll see how that surfaces later in this passage as well. When you're not minding your business, when you're idle, you tend to want to mind someone else's. So he's addressing the same issue, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands. It's already there. And in the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians, he told <coughs> the membership in the church, warn them that are unruly. Unruly in First Thessalonians 5 was translated from the same Greek word as disorderly in Second Thessalonians 3 and carries the sense of idleness as well as not walking according to protocols. So this was a lingering problem with the church. It's not something that just recently began. Withdraw. What, what, what is Paul really saying here? There's, I don't know if it's Amish. I don't want to brand them unfairly. I'm playing on memory, but it seems that the Amish culture, very tight-knit, closed culture, does when someone in that culture 
Stray's practice a very severe form of shunning. Is it, Dave, am I correct on that? Uh, yeah, I understand, yeah. Maybe other uh, groups do as well. Paul is identifying, I believe, not excommunication, but rather some form of social, this is not the, a popular word these days, but I, I'm trying to, to find the best way I can, some form of social distancing. Let me, let me give you a very tame, and I, I would suggest a very wise practice of this passage that I have witnessed in church gatherings. You'll go to a church meeting and there's one person there who has some very odd ideas and he really wants to promote those ideas. So he's going to grab every person who walks by that he can hold on to and try to pump them full of his odd ideas. More than once, I've seen people doing this and church people hear two people talking and you get a sense they're not agreeing. Well, I want to find out what this is about and step up. And as soon as they discovered the topic of the discussion, they just smiled and turned around and walked away. You know what they did? They withdrew from the person who was being unruly. They didn't make a big, big explosion about it. They didn't do anything destructive, but they communicated that that person observed them that they didn't approve of what he was doing or she was doing. You don't have to make a stink and, and blow the lid off the house to express godly disapproval. You can do it in a kind and gracious way. <clears throat> and Paul clarifies, there's a standard of conduct and not after the tradition which he received of us. We live in a time when innovation and new is the big thing and the, the praised thing. Tradition is just about a four letter word in many Christian circles. Paul says tradition is a good thing when it's anchored in the teaching of scripture. Tradition that's not anchored in the teaching of scripture sooner or later will backfire and not be edifying to the benefit of the church. Paul says the, the, the rule to guide is not some tradition you created, but a, the tradition that he learned from us, the inspired word of God in scripture. <clears throat> verse seven, I may read some more verses to go with that. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Same word as up above. I wasn't idle, Paul is saying. <clears throat> I didn't walk irresponsibly. I honored the traditions I taught you in my own conduct. Paul is politely saying, I preached from my feet the same message I preached from the pulpit. Amen. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught for nothing as a gift or as a donation from the church, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. And, and notice Paul doesn't say I, but we, he and those with him who wrote this letter were together and all of us jointly did this. In the book of Acts, we learned that Paul by trade was a tent maker. It was common in the Jewish culture of the first century, however high in the religious protocols a man rose, and often to the point that he could devote his entire life to his religious activities. Every young man learned a trade which he could fall back on to make a living, and Paul's was making and selling tents. Paul says there were certain times in certain churches where because of the culture that I observed in the church. I had the biblical authority, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that, that treads out the grain to, to expect donations and support from you for my ministry. But I saw a greater need and for that greater need, I made tents and sold them and I didn't ask you for a penny. 
And he said, you folks were one of those churches. Why? If he's dealing with a church that has even a small number of people that are for religious reasons thinking they don't need to work, they need to see an example of a minister of the gospel who's willing to work and not just occasionally, but he said day and night, he was working overtime to provide for his needs so that he didn't create any form of liability to the Thessalonians. Verse nine, not because we have not power, authority, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. If those few people in the church who had decided to stop working and live on the charity of the church followed Paul's example, they'd go back to work. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. Back to that same word, idly, irresponsibly, not following expected protocol. Working not at all, but our busybodies. Human nature is human nature. First century, 21st century, it doesn't matter. When a human being avoids or neglects his own personal responsibility, he's going to be very inclined to meddle in yours. And that's what Paul said, that's the word busybody. It's interesting, Tom Constable in his commentary, uh, expository, expository notes on the Bible, identified that in certain cultures, the idea of being a busybody is described by a short sentence. You're dipping your spoon in my cup. <laughs> the person who's a busybody thinks, well, I, I know more about that person's business and I know more about their life. And if they'll just listen to me, their life will be a whole lot better. Well, that may be true and it may not be. But you don't offer that unless you're invited to do it. You don't put your spoon in someone else's coffee unless you're invited to put your spoon in their coffee. There's one person. I, I'll, I'll give you my own personal taste about such matters. There is one person on planet Earth who can put her spoon in my cup in my plate, in my meal, any time she wants. I draw the line right there. <laughs> I love you folks. You're the dearest people on earth to me, but don't put your spoon in my cup. <laughs> oh. And to be honest, the busybody will often get just about the same kind of response as if you were eating the best soup you ever tasted and they walked up and stuck their dirty spoon in your cup to get a taste of your soup without your permission. <laughs> it's not welcome, not well received. <clears throat> Now them that are such, we command, back to that very strong word, and exhort by example, walk beside, lead beside, by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. You see, the problem was not that these people could not work. It was that they would not work. I believe not only here, but in multiple teachings throughout the New Testament, and Paul affirms the point. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. If you are able to work, the New Testament rule, then work and support the church and support those in the church, through the church that have needs who cannot work because of age or bad health. Here were some able-bodied people who were able to work, who because of false belief chose not to. Paul says that needs to stop. <clears throat> ah. 
God. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. He doesn't forget the body of the church because of a few people in the church who are ignoring the protocol of good, healthy faith. <clears throat> Keep doing well and don't be discouraged or get tired or give up. Let me ask you folks. You, we went for, I believe, full 13 months without meeting at church one time. And we've been meeting, and with some limitations, of course, for, a, I don't know how long now? Eight months. Eight months. Okay. Any time during that 13 months when we didn't meet, we just, you saw me streaming or we talked on the phone. Any time when you ever got a little discouraged, is this ever going to end? I, I, I've been preaching for 65, 66 years. I, I missed, I think at most three Sundays in a row for either health or a family vacation. That was the limit in 66 years. I thought when, when we said, well, we need to respect the medical recommendations and not meet, and it'll last a month or two, maybe three. You, you and I talked about it, right? Yeah, it won't be that long. 12, 13 months later, before we could safely more or less safely, get back to work in church again. During that time, did you feel a little discouraged, a little weary? Is it ever going to? Yeah, I still think that once in a while, don't you? You think it's calming down and then here comes a new variant that's more contagious than the other one. I'm encouraged. They're still studying the latest one, but that the historical pattern of this kind of, of virus, as it changes and evolves, it becomes for its own survival more contagious and less deadly. So the latest variant it could still take a person's life. It's, it's not a, a small thing but it's likely more contagious. It's easier to catch it, but you have less likelihood of dying from it than you did the original. Do you ever get discouraged? Will it ever end? Will we ever go back to normal? If not, what is that new normal that we don't know yet? It's easy in this world to get tired, isn't it? to get weary, and weary in well-doing, and not weary in, in, in neglect, but weary in well-doing. Paul says, don't. You've got a God who's not tired. He didn't cause the virus. He may not supernaturally intervene and kill it, but he's with you through whatever you face because of it. Keep him in your mind. I wrote about a dear old man I knew in my youth, a poor man, but a, a devoted, faithful man. He didn't have a lot of money, but he bought John Gill's commentaries and Body of Divinity. I was visiting with him one spring, and he pointed over to it, and he said, I read, I read that entire set over the winter four months, and he read Gil's commentary and Gil's box. You know how big that, go back in the back room and look, we have a copy back there. It's like that, it's encyclopedic. And he read it in four months. And not only that, he told me where he agreed and where he disagreed with John Gill. He read it thinking and with his Bible open. I made the point in one of my writings recently, he understood 
that he could give the they's who were adversarial in his world to the him who was the Lord of his faith and greater than any adversary. And he didn't have to fight him. He had a God who took care of that for him better than he could take care of it. Be not weary in your well-doing. Stay faithful. Keep your courage up. <clears throat> and then Paul becomes seemingly a little more intense. Verse 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. I'm glad Paul didn't stop there. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The culture of a godly church where every human being will not 100% of the time agree with every other human being in the church. How do you, how do you deal with it? How do you get along? Two passages I want to have you think about. <clears throat> First Peter chapter five, begin with verse five. Paul has just talked about the elder who the, I, I believe based on his description, he's talking about the office of elder, the pastor, the preacher, the teacher of the gospel. And then he begins with verse five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. This could be the elder in office or the elder in the faith. Submit yourselves. That means you don't fault find and nitpick and argue. Yea, all of you, regardless of age, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Interestingly, apparently in the first century, people who were slaves typically wore an apron. It was a work apron, like a woman who wears an apron all day because she's working in the kitchen all day cooking. <clears throat> Literally, when Paul said, be clothed with humility, he said, be clothed with the apron of your position as a servant, as a slave of Jesus and a slave of his people. That's the spirit of biblical Christianity. And then he explains the reason for God resisteth the proud. Now, I, I, can, I can deal with resistance from you folks, and I'll find a way to work it out. But hey, I don't want to look on the other side of resistance and see God standing there resisting me. Do you? <laughs> I don't think so. And conversely, he giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all, not part, not some, all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Recently, in one of his sermons, Brother John Thrower made a fascinating point, and it's so true, so, so true. He said, I don't submit to you as being my superiors, Philippians chapter two, as being better than yourself. I don't try to serve you because I think you deserve it. You don't, and I don't. Mm -hmm. But I serve you because my God told me that's what I'm supposed to do. And my God deserves my service. And that service means I serve you. Amen. 
that gets us off the high horse attitudes that seem so prevalent out there in the world today and sometimes invade the Christian faith and culture. We're not here to serve each other because we think so lowly of ourselves or so highly of you or because we think you're so special. We're here to serve God and that God who deserves to be served said, you should be serving each other. We're doing it to honor him and to do what he told us we should be doing. Now let's get right down to the nitty gritty of this passage. How can you and I, how can we as the collective church culture deal with that person in the church who sometimes goes out of rank, missteps, and needs to be number one, communicated with, and number two, corrected. How do we do that and keep it safe? Galatians chapter six. We'll probably finish up right here this morning. Paul has just completed an extensive lesson on the fruit of the spirit, on walking after the spirit and not after the flesh. So this is contextual with what he taught there and is the perfect manifestation of that conduct in a believer. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, were those few people in the Thessalonian church who had quit working and becoming dependent on the church, the church's charity, were they overtaken in a fault? Yes. If any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one. I'm, I'm setting some marks for you, whether you know it or not. You see someone in the church who is overtaken in a fault. <clears throat> you owe that person communication and encouragement to correct. Are you spiritual? <laughs> I'm not sure always the person who says, yes, I'm the most spiritual person in the church is truly so. <clears throat> but the first qualification is not on that person and what he is or is not doing. The first qualification Paul lays is on me. If I'm spiritual, then I need to take a step but I need to be really sure I'm spiritual before I take that step, don't I? Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of, I know better and you're a dummy if you don't listen to me. No, very opposite. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. <clears throat> The word restore, such an one, was used in the medical field of the first century. Quite often, it would be used of someone who, by some form of accident, broke a bone, let's say a leg bone. You which are spiritual, restore. You don't stand out to one side and say, he broke his bone and it's own silly fault that he did it and accuse and judge and condemn, what do you do? You broke your bone. Here, I have a plaster of Paris. I think I can help you put a cast around that, that break. We'll make sure it's set right and we'll do the very best we can together to, to splint and cast it and, and by the way, you're going to need to move around and take care of life functions and business for some time while that bone is healing. Here, I'll be your crutch as long as you need me. Let me help you. That's restoring in the spirit of meekness. 
considering yourself. That could be me who broke my leg instead of you who broke yours. Wouldn't I hope that you would do the same to me that I did to you? Do you feel safe in that kind of a setting? Oh, yes. Pray for it if you ever have one of those moments. Bear ye one another's burdens. Exactly what he just said to do with this one who was overtaken in a fault. Restore. I had not noticed the next part of this verse until just the last couple of days. Bear ye one another's burdens. Let me carry some of that weight till you can go back to carrying it on your own. <clears throat> and so fulfill the law of Christ. Christ said, how you treat each other is so important. It's a law in my kingdom. It's a compulsory attitude and action. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Amen. If you have love one to another, love in action, love at work. Thank you, Lord, for putting that law in your kingdom. We need it. For if any man think himself to be something, have you ever felt that with a little ego pump <laughs> who hasn't at one time or another, right? When he is nothing, oops, <laughs> he deceiveth himself. Suddenly, the person who thinks he is something becomes the person with the fault that overtook him, and he needs restoring. He's not above being restored. But then Paul seems to add a little bit of a different wrinkle. But let every man prove, test, and validate his own work. Back to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 3. Does Paul say one thing about you and me testing someone else's work, putting our spoon in someone else's cup? No, you test your work. I don't test yours. You test yours, I test mine. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. <coughs> and then the, the big wrinkle, for every man shall bear his own burden. Paul, you just said you're supposed to bear other people's burdens. Yes, when they're broken and wounded. But if you're healthy and strong in the faith, don't be like the Thessalonian minority and, and throw yourself on the dependence of the church. And well, I, I know I did wrong, but they'll forgive me anyway. <clears throat> Bear your burden responsibly and faithfully. Your burden is to carry someone else's. Bear it faithfully because the day will come. It's not the day might come. Hear me, my friends. The day shall come. If we live long in this world together, when it's not you that has the broken leg and needs me to help with the cast and the crutch, but it'll be me, and I'll need you with the cast and the crutch to help me. That's, that's power of this lesson. I read this story. It, it brings this old lesson really into our world. I read it many years ago. A young man is attending seminary. He wants to be a pastor in another denomination. He meets 
a godly Christian girl in college. They start going together. They fall in love. They're going to get married. And as human nature goes, things get a little out of hand. And she becomes pregnant. He has been, and so has she, a very loud voice against abortion. What do they do? If he graduates college with that on his record, where's the church that'll probably want him to be their pastor? He starts thinking about this and he persuades her to have an abortion. It broke his heart. The conviction broke his heart, but he thought it was absolutely necessary. He's called to pastor a church. And of all things, this church is located in a place where a, a large abortion facility has thrived. And this church has been the leading voice in the community opposing and trying to offer legitimate, biblical, sincere help to women who need some kind of help and crutch to take care of a newborn baby and to get their life back on track. Of all things, he feels like the biggest hypocrite in the world. He can preach on everything in the Bible without any problem in his mind, but there's one thing he, he chokes every time he thinks about it. He cannot preach the sermon against abortion knowing his own record. The conviction of conscience overcame and finally, at a church business gathering, <clears throat> where just the membership is gathered for business, he asks to speak, and he makes his confession. And he lets the church know how convicted he feels and how wrong he was. A wise person, older member, looked up to by the church, spoke up. We've all made mistakes. I have every reason to believe that our pastor learned from his mistake. I make a motion that the church forgive him and continue with him as our pastor by his experience in this, in this effort and this activity. He's more equipped than anybody we could replace him with to go out there and stand up and be a voice against what we oppose. The church unanimously agreed. They forgave him and he continued indefinitely as that church's pastor. There's a man who pretended for a while he didn't need a crutch, that he needed a big one, but there was a church when he did need it that said, here, we'll give you the crutch you need, and we'll all be stronger because of it. That, my friends, I believe, is the big message we need to learn from the New Testament about a church and church culture. God bless you. <clears throat>